Hi, this is Professor McGuire, and welcome to this concept video uh, discussing the concept of complexity in relationship to environmental policy and environmental issues in general. And specifically, in this case, when we're talking about complexity, we're talking about the desire and willingness and of human beings to try to attempt to model environmental issues, to, to try to understand what's happening in the natural world and apply that understanding in a way that actually matches what's going on in the natural world. And in this case, we're going to talk about, specifically, we're going to use a case example of carbon, trying to model carbon uh, in the global uh, carbon cycle uh, on Earth to try to get an understanding of what's happening in terms of, uh, most importantly, climate change. So by way of introduction, the environment, we can say the natural environment, it's dynamic. And we don't understand everything about it. And that's been the case uh, throughout human history. It's currently the case. And it may, in fact, and likely, probability-wise, will be the fact for the foreseeable future and maybe forever. In other words, we may never know everything about our natural environment, particularly um, how, so how that natural environment interacts and works. We certainly know more today uh, than we've ever known relatively speaking, objectively, about our natural environment. Collectively, uh, we know more today as a species, as a human species, uh, than we ever have. Uh, but there's still so much that we don't know. One of the analogies that helps me think about this is if you, um, as a seeing person, uh, were to walk into a completely dark room with the door closed, and the room is entirely dark to you, and you are only using your vision, as your capacity to understand what was going on. In that complete darkness, you would understand very little to nothing, um, not using your ears, we're not talking about auditory or feel or touch or smell or taste, but only using your eyes, uh, your ability to see as the mechanism as which you can understand what's going on in this environment. And since it's completely pitch black, you understand nothing, almost nothing about what's happening other than there's complete darkness and you can't really see anything. That may be, you know, if we thought about that from a, uh, again, from a sort of a metaphorical standpoint, um, that may be an example of where we know nothing about our environment. Maybe as we begin to experience our environment, these small little pinholes, think of a sort of a pinprick in that room, and the pinprick would be through the wall and outside of that completely dark room, there would be nothing but light. And so if you were to take a pin, uh, sort of a needle, and just make a small needle pin prick into the wall, one little beam of light would shine through. And that tiny little beam of light might reflect on another portion across the way of the darkness. It would, of course, it'd be the beam itself of light that you could see moving um, from one direction across to another direction to a point on either the floor or the ceiling or the wall, whatever is opposite, depending on the angle of the beam of light from it in that completely dark space. And as you saw that small bit of light, it would shed a piece of information. It might not help you very much in understanding or, or determining what's happening in that room. Again, only talking about vision here, not any other sensory perceptions, it, but it would give you more information than with nothing. Then if you were to take another pinprick into the wall and you get another beam of light and another pinprick and another pinprick, you can understand that over time, the more, the more pinpricks, the more little beams of light, tiny little beams of light that are coming through, all of those individual pieces add up collectively to a better understanding of what's going on in that space. What does the space look like? what's happening in that space from a visual perspective. And so through this process, you would, you would gain a better and deeper understanding. And so what, using that sort of analogy, we can say that we may never, you know, have so many pinpricks. If a pinprick represents a unit of knowledge, a, a, a level of deeper understanding about our environment, if that's what it's meant to represent, and that's what I'm suggesting it might represent for us to understand this. Each pinprick provides us with additional information about what's happening 
but it never provides us with all of the information. And it may be that we never get to the point where we have enough pinpricks that we shed complete and utter light into that room so that we can see everything. But there may come a point, and then we may be at a point even now, where we have enough pinpricks that we can see enough light that is coming through, that we can gain a deeper understanding about a lot of the parts of our system. Now, the other point I want to make quickly um, is that when we're talking about our environment, we're talking about what happens here on Earth. At the larger scales, and that's what I'm talking about here, the complexity is significant. And if we think of the Earth as the largest unit of scale for observing the Earth or thinking about or understanding what's going on, the Earth system itself within the Earth, that large scale, the Earth system, is incredibly complex relative to our understanding. That doesn't mean we don't know a lot about it. It just means that the complexity level is really high. So when we think about Earth system issues like carbon, you know, the carbon cycling throughout the entire Earth system relative to the problem of climate change, if we were to use this as a deep-seated, difficult problem for human beings to try to overcome as one example of complexity when we talk about environmental issues, there's a lot for us to know that we simply do not know. There's a lot of dark space that we uh, naturally that is affecting our ability to to really understand cause and effect, to understand all of the sort of interrelated issues that are happening. But that doesn't mean that we don't understand a lot of what's going on in that Earth system, and we don't understand a lot about you know cause and effect. Relatively speaking, we might not understand everything, and the key is we don't have to necessarily understand everything in that system. So that's an important point to make, that complexity means that it's difficult to understand all aspects of what's going on, but that doesn't necessarily mean we need to understand all aspects to have a good understanding of relative cause and effect and the probability of certain actions. And the question is, what do we do about that? So from a systems perspective, think of the environment, as I said, as a system. We know there are parts of the system, parts of the system that are unknown, things that we simply don't know. Think of areas where light has yet to be shed within that room. There are things that are not fully known. We might have shed some light. We have some, you know, some holes that are shedding light into the room on something, but it doesn't expose that thing fully. So we know something about it, but we don't know everything we need necessarily to know or all of the um, possibilities of what might be known. And even when we do know something, sometimes under different conditions, it can act differently than we understand. So we might have a good understanding of some of the components, some of the variables of that system. Think of a very complex system. But we might only know those variables relative to certain conditions. And when those conditions change, those variables might act differently than what we expected. You think of conditions like temperature or you know other other things that we can't control for. And the point I wanna make about control about something like the earth system, one of the difficulties in knowing everything is we can't have a controlled earth. We do not have in a perfect lab experiment or in a perfect experiment, you would have a hypothesis about, you know, what might happen should you make a change onto something. And the way in which you can measure the change is you have two examples that you're testing. You have the tested entity or group or thing, and then you have a control that you don't apply these changes to. You don't apply whatever the thing that you're applying to. And in the case of the Earth, of course, we don't have a controlled Earth. We don't have a second Earth that we can control for. So for example, vis-a-vis -vis climate change, it would be wonderful if we had another Earth that was just like this Earth and under the very same conditions, very hard to replicate, um, outside of sort of laboratory controls, but um, you can imagine that. And um, we were, we never engaged in carbon forcing on that other earth, that controlled earth. And then we could see differences and we could really then gain a better understanding. But since we don't have that controlled earth, a lot of what we have to do is interpolate our activities. We can understand some of the th ways in which we're changing some of the variables, for example, forcing carbon into the atmosphere. But we don't truly understand 
the effects of that ultimately, because we don't understand all of the feedback possibilities of doing that. And that's what we mean when we say we act that sometimes these variables can act differently than we understand. Since we do not have that control, you know, we don't have the ability to, to see differential, to see, well, if we didn't do this, what's going on in that same circumstances? You know, our global averages temperatures increasing similarly to our what we're doing here when we're forcing carbon. So that makes from a systems perspective, the issue of complexity when it comes to environmental issues, a bit difficult. But we deal with this complexity, all of this, the unknowns, the not fully knowns, and then even variables we know acting differently than we expected. We can deal with this complexity by starting from basic assumptions, very, very basic assumptions. And then through trial and error, using a scientific method, reducing the amount of unknown over time. So the key and we've been doing this as a species and certainly relative to carbon we've been studying it for de many decades now since you know the human impact the human effect on moving carbon from a stored place to a another the atmosphere mostly we've been studying this in great detail and we've been studying some of the correlations some of the other the effects that we're seeing some of the relationships between more carbon in the atmosphere and other things you know um sea level rise, um, thermal expansion of seawater, um, ice melts, uh, so on and so forth, other things that we can then correlate. Um, and again, these are correlations, which doesn't mean causation, because we don't have that. We don't have that level of articulation. So what we're effectively doing is we're more and more of those pinholes, and we're trying to sort of see where those pinholes come together and deal with the complexity in that way. So let's look at this. Let's start from the simple assumptions, test, and then increase complexity. Let's see what that looks like relative to carbon, as an example, to try to understand complexity in environmental issues. So often when we talk about, you know, systems in the environment, really in many ways about system interactions, we don't, we think, we try to think about it from, let's say, an ecosystem perspective or a systems perspective. We look at our environment in a wider range and we see, you know, we might notice something, we might notice a change, we might notice, you know, a species of tree dying off in a particular area, but doing better in a different area, we might see movements of a species of aquatic organisms moving from one, you know, sort of area of the ocean to a sort of uh, higher latitude, let's say from a warmer area of ocean to a slightly cooler area of the ocean, um, as and that might give us some understanding of what's happening with you know the average temperatures of that ocean water to some degree we might look at coral reefs and see a die-off of coral and then we want to explore what might be causing the die-offs you understand so in order to truly understand some of these observations we have to look more holistically and that's what we mean when we say a systems analysis so when we say systems usually we model because again we don't have examples and we don't understand all of the variables we model complexity using often what's called like box modeling as a one way of starting from those very simple assumptions. And a simple box model might look something like you see here, where you have you know, your inflows, you have basically a system component, something you're looking at, that singular component of a system. And then you're looking at things that flow into the system, things that might flow out of that system component, and then any feedback, any sort of, you know, a relative cause and effect, any sort of correlation between inflows, outflows, and what effects that may have on the system. That's what a system, or I'm sorry, a simple box, box model is meant to represent. We can provide a simple box model, just what we showed, relative to carbon. And we can look at it in terms of carbon and look at, again, a system component. So we can say, for example, we can have inflows. We can look at you know 10 units of carbon, for example, flowing into a system component. And then that carbon has some interaction with the system. You could look at the atmosphere, for example. And then we might have outflows, right? And the outflows might be seven units of carbon. And we may have a feedback loop. And the question we might ask ourselves, for example, is, well, if 10 units of carbon moved into the atmosphere and only a net seven units of carbon moved out, so we measure the atmosphere and it has 100 units of carbon, and then 10 units of carbon enter the atmosphere, now it has 110 units. And then we wait a little while and we notice that there's some outflow of carbon. 
because we measure 103 units. So we say, well, there's about seven units, the difference between 110 and 100 and, and 100, the original versus, you know, minus the 100 and uh, the 10 additional units, 110. So we now have 103 units of carbon instead of 100. So we know seven units of carbon were removed, but where is that? Where are the remaining three units of carbon? Are they still in the atmosphere? 103 units, for example, do we measure? Or, you know, are, what happens? Do they stay in the atmosphere? If we measure 100 units of carbon still in the atmosphere, but we've only measured seven units of carbon leaving, you know, what's going on there, for example? Where is that other carbon going? So we're looking at feedbacks. And regardless, if there's an increase, net increase from 100 to 103, uh, units of carbon in the atmosphere, we want to ask, is that, do we notice, are there any, is there anything to observe in relationship that, to that additional concentration? It doesn't mean that it's in fact caused by that additional concentration. We can't prove that. We don't have that other earth, for example, that is, um, you know, where there are no units of carbon being added, that sort of thing. But this is one way that we can start thinking about measuring and looking at carbon relative to, you know, um, a basic box model analysis. Now we can increase that complexity of that model. And what we can do is we can say, look, here's a more complex box model of carbon where we can have the inputs from external sources who say 10 units, but other, you know, whatever that is, right? Additional units of carbon. And then how that carbon is affecting multiple system components, maybe not just focusing on one system component, but now looking more than just the atmosphere, looking at you know other parts of the Earth system, for example, another component besides the atmosphere, um, you know, another um, and yet another component, and then we can not only look at you know the large scale input and then output or outflows or you know feedbacks, but we can look at them intra between system components. We can start seeing are there any measuring any potential feedbacks within the systems. Is any of the carbon moving here? Is that causing any feedbacks here? I can, you know, there's not examples of the sort of arrows pointing in every direction because it would become a little too overwhelming visually, I think. But you can, you understand the point here. We're looking at system components and all of their airing intra, you know, internal and then sort of external. So we can look at it, you know, between system components and then holistically overall as well. And so that's a more complex version of a model for carbon to try to understand complexity as we're sort of ratcheting it up. And then we can look at a very complex box model of carbon. And this is where we can start actually, you know, this is an example of really a carbon cycle where we can see the, you know, um, the carbon cycle and express in sort of a gigatons of carbon, lots and lots of carbon. Um, and we can see effectively, you know, what's going on in terms of where the carbon, you know, where some additional carbon is entering the system, where it's being taken out of the system relative, right? You know, so we have, you know, primary production in terms of, you know, uh, some of the um, plants, you know, and then plant respiration, and then we can have decomposition of organic matter, we have net destruction of vegetation, human activities, um, and then we can have some, you know, river runoff, we can have ocean absorption, um, these should be backwards. I they should these are in the wrong. Uh, but we have ocean absorption should be this way. It just this is the way it came out visually when it got copied over about that. And ocean release, you know, it's we have a little bit more being taken up by the oceans, as you can see, that is being released by the ocean. Um, what the ocean holds as a bank, you know, what the atmosphere holds as a bank, and then you know, deep sea burial. What's going on there in terms of trying to understand sort of a larger, more detailed. So this represents a more complex, a very complex, relatively speaking, model of carbon based on a lot of work, a lot of work to understand how much. Are humans impacting in terms of how much are you know what does this add what is what is human activity in terms of burning fossil fuels add generally speaking per year what's going on with um you know plants mainly um both aquatic and terrestrial but you know what's going on with plants in terms of what are they doing in absorbing carbon what are they doing in respiring carbon and what's going on in terms of decomposition natural decomposition what are the soils doing in terms of the carbon take up what's happening in terms of you know our uh, deforestation activities that sort of thing if it's net where is it heading right 
Um, all of the different, you can imagine all of the scientific work, all of, all of the incredible complexity, and this isn't even coming close to representing the actual complexity, but it gives you a better understanding of what we end up seeing. And then we can see uh, 3.2 gigatons per year. It's more than that now, but um, you know, um, historically, this is what's been known. But what the atmosphere is doing is the atmosphere is absorbing, the oceans are absorbing some of our carbon, but there's still carbon that's just... Um, that's not being expressed that we don't know um, in terms of we're, we're getting a better understanding. But what you can imagine is from the original box model, the original notion, what we got here is we have a lot of these little light holes and we've been working very hard on this. And we have a lot of more uh, light penetrating through these pinholes if we're using that analogy from the, uh, from the introduction of being in the, the dark room. And it's shedding more and more light on the reality an understanding of what's happening in terms of carbon movement in our earth system. And we're getting much better at understanding these relationships because we're continuously spending our time and energy. And it's well worth it because um, the negative consequences of, you know, putting too much carbon into the atmosphere can be catastrophic. And we're already starting to feel some of that uh, difficulty. And so it's something that we should really be focused on because it affects every aspect of our society. And for those that want to know more about that, you can look into the uh, sort of any of the other uh, videos, but just as a concept video, we won't go into the uh, relationships between human activities in our environment and which one is constraining uh, more than the other. You know, are humans unconstrained? We can do anything we want without any negative consequences or does the environment constrain our activities? And in a world where we understand or accept the premise that the environment places the outer constraints on what humans can do, um, you know, that it's difficult when you affect the environment in a way that has negative consequences for human well-being. So anyway, this is a very complex box model of carbon that helps us better understand how we deal with that complexity. Does it tell us the whole story? No, not even close. Not even close to the whole story. Does it get us much closer to understanding the complexity issues uh, with carbon? Yes, we know much more about our relationship with carbon and carbon forcing in particular and its effect on the earth system today than we've ever known in the past. So to summarize complexity vis-a-vis -vis environmental issues, generally speaking, first of all, we can start off by saying we don't know everything. So there's no such thing as a perfect decision when we think about how this information, how complexity feeds back into the idea of how humans make decisions about the environment, whether we should take action, whether we shouldn't take action, what kind of actions we should take, if we agree we should take action, uh, what are the things we should consider, you know, the sort of what, what do we weigh, you know, what are the relative benefits and costs of certain actions, that kind of thing, all that we would think about from a policy standpoint, but it's at the end of the day, human decision making about what humans should and should not do. So we don't know everything, and we probably will never know everything. We'll never get that room full of light. But we do know more than nothing. And in some cases, a good deal about our environment, right? So even though we don't know everything, we certainly know more than nothing. And in some cases, a lot more than nothing. We know a good deal about what's going on with our environment and some of the sort of like, you know, relatively speaking, cause and effects. We have a good understanding of strong correlations between our activities and how they can affect parts of our environment in ways that bring us what many would argue are consequences that exceed any of the benefits of our actions, that the net cost is higher than the net benefits. But as we learn more things, we update what we know and thereby reduce what we do not know. So even though we know more than nothing, and in some cases a good deal, we're constantly in a process that as we learn more, we're updating what we know and therefore reducing what we do not know. We're, we're adding more pinholes. And by the way, you know, five or six pinholes shedding light on a part of that room might give us an impression about what is going on in that part of the room. But if we shed a few more pinholes, we have more light shining. And that light on that same part of the room might update our knowledge and understanding. We might realize that we were not 
fully correct. We might be incorrect, completely incorrect. Our assumptions might have been wrong. Or we might have to update parts of our understanding and say, now that we have a fuller picture of what's going on here, we have more light shed on this area. What we were saying was incomplete. And now we have a more complete understanding. Now that is... That's what we do as a society. And, you know, some people look at that as saying, well, that's that shows that you don't know what's going on. No, no, no. It shows that we're willing to update our information and it's about getting it right. And we don't always know exactly what's right. We have our best guess and understanding in any given moment, but letting more information, newer information that helps us gain a better understanding always creates the opportunity for updating. So people that, you know, when we understand more about something and therefore change parts of that understanding, that's a reflection of good practice. That's a reflection of honesty, integrity, and trying to get to a better and deeper understanding of the problem, not trying to defend a position, for example, um, simply because we stated it earlier as a society that we think this is what we know. And oh, no, now we know more. And what we thought isn't actually completely true. That's never a bad thing. That's a good thing. And the question is, from a policy standpoint, in a world where we don't know everything, and the world where new information can update our understanding, what kind of actions do we take in that world of uncertainty? So in this way, we're able to increase the accuracy of our model predictions over time as we learn more. But we may never know everything. But knowing everything is not a reason not to act. This is a question of probability versus certainty. So in a world where humans have to make decisions, what are we waiting for to make that decision? Do we require absolute certainty before we make a decision? Or are we willing to say, look, with the information we have now, it is highly probable. And that probability, even though it's not a certainty, is good enough. And from a policy standpoint, um, we have to ask ourselves, when we want to make good decisions based on the information we have, is it better to, again, make that decision with imperfect information or wait until you have perfect information, even though you probably will never have perfect information? An example might be if your doctor says to you, it is probable if you keep smoking that you will develop lung cancer and other smoking complications. Do you require from that statement, that accurate statement, even though the doctor can't tell you will absolutely, right, with certainty, get lung cancer, that most people who smoke for long periods of time do get lung cancer? That is a fact, but that doesn't mean that you will necessarily absolutely get lung cancer before you die from maybe some other cause, or, you know, I guess we all die from something. Does this require certainty before acting? So does that statement require certainty? Would you say to your doctor in response, well, I'm sorry, doctor, unless you can tell me for sure that I will absolutely die from lung cancer before I die from something else, old age or some other complication, then, you know, unless you can tell me that with certainty, then that doesn't change my behavior. I would hope that for most people, they would say, no, of course not. I would say that the probability alone is quite good enough for me to take that in and take that as a serious uh, warning that I should take different actions in order to avoid that worst case scenario, to avoid the possibility or the probability the high probability of getting lung cancer. And maybe this is what we mean when we're talking about environmental issues and dealing with the question of complexity when it comes to making good policy or humans making decisions in the, in the face of uncertainty, that kind of thing. So that hopefully gives us a good understanding of complexity relative to environmental issues using something that is quite complex, which is the carbon cycle in the earth system and what it means for humans to take in that information and still go through a decision-making process and still take action even without perfect information, understanding we probably will never have the level of information we need to act with absolute certainty on any issue, particularly when it comes to complex systems like our environment. So with knowing all of that, uh, we can then, for example, if you want to understand for, you know, relate this to some of the other concept videos. One in particular um, I was thinking about as I was discussing this was the margins. So if you think of the margins uh, video and understanding that, for example, 
over time as we as we think about and understand the complexity of carbon, but the problem with additional carbon units today, in other words, increasing the amount of carbon in our atmosphere, that the cost of that carbon, each molecule of carbon today, is much more today, the cost, than it was 10 years, 20 years, 50 years ago, because we're getting to levels of concentration, aggregate concentrations of carbon in the atmosphere that is that is, that is creating a feedback that is very negative for human well-being. That's causing all kinds of associated problems, the high probability of causing those problems. We're, we're seeing those problems. We're seeing them happen more. We're seeing the frequency and intensity of those problems increasing just as we uh, assumed they would based on increasing the level. So there's a lot of sort of correlation, strong sort of feedback correlation there that the presumptions and assumptions um, that we have a good understanding of that relationship, not a perfect understanding. So the question is, you know, uh, the margins uh, would help us understand why the cost of carbon is increasing. The same unit of carbon is increasing, and it's more costly today than it was in the past, and why that should inform also, in addition to understanding complexity, how we think about making decisions in this arena. That's just one example. There are many more. So I hope you enjoy this, and that's just uh, one taste of how these concept videos are meant to interrelate with each other. Thank you very much.